Good afternoon. I'm Mandy Cohen, Secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services, and I'm joined by Director Mike Sprayberry, and we have matching uh, face coverings today um, that have North Carolina on it that we wanted to share with you. Uh, Nicole Fox and Brian Tipton are our American Sign Language interpreters, and working behind the scenes are our Sp Spanish translators, Jackie and Jasmine Metevier. So I'll start with a rundown of the numbers. As of this morning, there were 19,700 laboratory from confirmed cases, 585 people are currently hospitalized, and sadly, um, there have now been 691 deaths. With Avery County now reporting its first case of COVID-19, we have lab confirmed cases in all 100 counties of North Carolina. It's another reminder that as we look forward to moving to phase two, we have to practice new habits. You're gonna hear me say every day, practice your three W's, wear, wait, wash, wear a face covering, wait six feet apart and wash your hands often no matter where you are in North Carolina. May is also Older Americans Month, a time to recognize the important contributions of older adults across our state. Our seniors make countless contributions to our communities, and we recognize the experiences and sacrifices they've made to strengthen and enrich our lives, our workforce, our families, they're our neighbors. We're supporting older adults in North Carolina in many ways during this pandemic. To protect the safety of our seniors, we're providing home delivered or grab and go meals instead of congregate meals. Our area agencies on aging, adult day and health programs are continuing to provide services but do it virtually. We've been partnering with universities to send students to help make wellness checks on our seniors and also have a grant to combat social isolation by providing technology and training on how to use that new equipment. We also have a team dedicated to supporting our long-term care facilities as they protect our aging family members and loved ones who require around-the-clock care and, and the staff who care for them. We are sending all long-term care facilities in the state PPE packets of needed supplies, and we are increasing rates for some Medicaid services to, to support infection prevention and management. We also have provided a toolkit and virtual trainings to support long-term care facilities in preparing for and responding to COVID-19 outbreaks in their facility. Another way we can honor them is to do our part to protect our older loved ones, friends, and neighbors who are at higher risk for severe illness from COVID-19. When we wear a face covering and we wait six feet apart, we're showing we care about those around us. People can have COVID-19 and not have any symptoms. If we don't practice the three W's, wear, wait, and wash, we can unknowingly expose people to the virus. We all need to do our part to look out for those in our community who are at higher risk. I've seen lots of social media posts about people picking up groceries for a neighbor or calling a friend or relative just to check in. Please continue to take care of yourself and those around you. And remember, wear, wait, and wash. With that, I'll turn it over to Director Mike Sprayberry. Thank you, Madam Secretary, and good afternoon. I want to start today with an update on severe weather in North Carolina. We continue to monitor the situation in our coastal counties and any lingering impacts from Tropical Storm Arthur. As of this morning, portions of NC-12 and several secondary roads continued to be impacted by standing water. All major interstates and highways are open at this time. We're also monitoring storm systems that will impact our state over the next few days with heavy rainfall. Some of our western counties could see several inches of rain before Friday. The National Weather Service has parts of western North Carolina under a moderate potential for flash flooding today and tonight. That risk extends into the Piedmont tomorrow. Heaviest rains are expected tonight and tomorrow morning and flooding is possible along the Catawba, Yadkin, New, and Dan Rivers. We are in close contact with our local partners as they evaluate potential impacts to their communities, and we've placed two Type 3 
swift water rescue teams on alert should they be needed in western North Carolina. Everyone, especially those living along rivers and streams, should be alert to the possibility of flooding and landslides and should have a way to receive weather alerts, like a NOAA weather radio or a weather app on your smartphone. You can also monitor river and stream levels and get flood alerts from our flood inundation mapping and alert network. We call it FIMAN, and the website is FIMANNC.NC.gov. That's F-I-M-A-N dot N-C dot gov. Today is day 71 of the State Emergency Operations Center's COVID-19 response. We're continuing to distribute personal protective gear to long-term care facilities across the state. Nursing homes and other types of care facilities are picking up supplies in Greensboro today and more facilities will pick up tomorrow and Friday in Mecklenburg County. More than 3,000 licensed long-term care homes across the state are receiving a two-week supply of protective equipment, and many of them tell us they're very glad to receive it. I want to acknowledge again the partnership and work that went into this project with our fantastic partners at the Office of Emergency Medical Services and other DHHS partners, the North Carolina National Guard, and our state and local emergency management partners. From our warehouses, teams delivered supplies to 59 counties and two health care preparedness coalitions yesterday. That's an ongoing mission. Shipments included isolation gowns, gloves, face shields, multiple types of masks, goggles, thermometers, and hand sanitizer. We received around 70,000 gowns yesterday. At our current request rate of 9,700 gowns per day, this is around a seven-day supply. We're continuing efforts to procure gowns and other types of PE, PPE, and we are working with the private sector to manufacture PPE right here in North Carolina. As Secretary Cohen mentioned, this is Older Americans Month. So remember that one of the best ways you can look out for and protect the older folks in your life is by observing the three W's. Wear a cloth face covering, wait at least six feet apart, and wash your hands often. That's wear, wait, and wash. Follow Secretary Cohen's guidance. We also want to thank our local partners for all the great work they've been doing to keep their community safe. And as always, don't forget to look out for your family, friends, and neighbors. Call your loved ones daily. Guaranteed they'll appreciate it. With kindness and cooperation, we will all get through this together as one team, one mission, and one family. Thank you very much. And now back to Secretary Cohen for questions and answers. Great. Thank you, Director Sprayberry. And now open for your questions. We'll take our first question from Stephanie Santos-Sazi at WLOS-TV, Asheville. Yes. Hi, Dr. Cohen. This is Stephanie Santos-Sazi. Yesterday at 4 p.m., we all received the number of patients presumed to be recovered. My question for you is, how are you all classifying who is recovered and what criteria must be met for a person to fall into this recovery category? Thanks, Stephanie. Yes, we are updating our recovery numbers once per week. So we updated those yesterday afternoon. Again, the recovery numbers are an estimate. Um, we explain how we get to that estimate on, uh, uh, on the website, but let me walk you through it. First, um, for folks who are not hospitalized, we make an assumption from the time in which you, your test comes back, from the time your sample is collected, for 14 days, um, we assume that you are recovered at the end of those 14 days. If you need to be hospitalized, we make an assumption that its uh, recovery takes 28 days. Again, these are estimates. Some people may take longer to recover. Others may be sooner in terms of recovery. Um, but that's the best estimate that we, we can make at this point. And we know I think that number now is up at 11,000 in terms of, of recovery. Um, we know that folks are recovering every day from COVID-19. We wanted to give folks a sense of that estimate. 
I will note that CDC has not put out any official guidance on how we should be calculating uh, that estimate. So this is our, our best attempt at doing that. If the CDC does change the way in which they are estimating, uh, then we may need to change our estimates as well. Um, but we are trying to give folks a sense uh, once a week about how our recovery numbers look here in North Carolina as an estimate. Thank you. Our next question is from Julie Havlack with the Carolina Journal. Hi, thank you so much. I wanted to ask if you are planning to go back into in-person briefings anytime soon? Hi, Julie. Thanks for that question. Um, you know, we are looking at all of the things across the board related to uh, risk and as we are thinking about easing into phase two, what that would mean. Um, we want to make sure that we, no matter what we are doing, we're going to continue to tell businesses to be teleworking where wherever possible. And given the nature that we can create um, a scenario where we can continue to social distance as well as continue to be uh, transparent, take questions every single day, um, I imagine we're going to continue with distance briefings at least for the time being, um, but we'll, we'll let you know if that changes. Again, we, we want to create the most safe environments that we can for folks, or I should say the lowest risk environments for folks. Um, so if we continue to do that at, at, a, at a distance, we will continue to do that. Um, obviously, we'll continue to watch our numbers and our trends um, and make adjustments as we go forward. Our next question is from Corey Johnson with WCTI News Channel 12. Hi, Dr. Cohen. Uh, my name is Corey Johnson. My question is regarding hair salons. Um, the Hair is Essential Association is planning to file a lawsuit alleging that they've been prevented from pursuing their vocations during this time. Why have other businesses been allowed to reopen and have hair salons been discriminated against in this way? Thanks, Corey, for that question. So as you know, we um, initially limited a number of businesses, particularly ones that we felt like were incredibly high risk. As you know, this virus is transmitted when people come into close contact with each other over a prolonged period of time. And that means usually within six feet for more than 10 minutes of time. And if you think of when you get your hair done, right, there is literally, you are right on top to someone um, when you're doing that and it is over a period of time. So it's one of the higher risk uh, scenarios, um, both for patrons and for the employees. Um, the other tricky part about this virus that we keep talking about is that folks can have COVID-19 and they don't know it. Um, that is why an important component of as we think about easing restrictions, we want people to wait six feet apart, we want them to wash their hands, but we also want them to wear a face covering. Now, in a salon situation, you can't be six feet apart. You just can't deliver those services and be cutting someone's hair six feet away. That's why these other measures, as we think about easing restrictions, are going to be so important for folks to follow, to be able to wear a face covering, to be able uh, to be washing down surfaces um, and, and such as we go forward. It's going to be really important. We don't want folks to be getting sick and potentially dying from this. Um, so we want to be protecting people's public, uh, protecting the public's health as much as possible here. Um, so we think we've made uh, some decisions in order to do that. As we look at our numbers, we see them remain stable, uh, that we, we believe we can move forward to easing restrictions and salons would be part of those easing of restrictions just at the end of this week. Um, so I'd say hang, hang in there. We're gonna keep watching our numbers. Um, right now we see it, them largely be stable. They're not perfect, but they are largely stable in terms of our ability to respond to this virus um, in order for us to see that we have the testing that we want to have. Um, so those are good, that's good news. And so as we've said, as we move into phase two, which we hope to do at the end of this week, salons would be part of that, but there are going to be additional restrictions on that to keep the visiting of a salon to be as, as safe as possible. Our next question is from Steve Wiseman with the Raleigh News and Observer. Hey, Dr. Cohen, Steve Watson at the News and Observer. I want to ask you about uh, the, the, is DHHS collecting aggregate contract tracing data from around the state to determine patterns, hotspots, and other useful information, and will you be sharing that information? Steve, thanks for that. Um, so as you know, we um, al already are required to collect some information about where there might be hotspots. 
We are required to have labs report us positive cases from wherever that lab um, is. So that's how we get our positive uh, lab reports. In addition, um, there are certain types of community, uh, certain types of sectors that are required to report to us um, whether or not they are seeing an outbreak. Some of those uh, um, uh, sectors are, for example, our congregate living settings. Um, folks like nursing homes or uh, congregate living shelters of, of various types, they are required to report that. They report that to their local health department, who in turn then reports that to the state. We aggregate that information, and then we post that on our website. There are a few other industries um, that also are required to report, like a child care or a, or a school setting, um, but they're, they're an isolated number of those sectors that are required to report uh, to us when they see those outbreaks. Um, so we are posting already the congregate living settings. And what we are able to do is show down to a zip code level where are the positive cases coming when the lab reports to us? So we feel like that's a lot of information that we're able to give folks in terms of pinpointing around the state, um, where do we see highest number of cases? So we're able to see at the zip code level, um, the positive lab reports that come in, we're able to see also then to, to uh, cluster those at, at certain types of facilities, like I said, like congregate living facilities that are required to report to us. Thank you. The next question is from Michael Falero with WFAE News. Yes, hi there, Dr. Cohen. This is Michael Falero with WFAE. Question for you about hospitalization numbers. Uh, that 585 is the highest level since April 15th, at least. Um, what does this mean as a trend for starting phase two this week? Michael, great question about hospitalizations. As you know, hospitalizations, one of four trends that we look at, as well as two to three capacities um, that we also uh, look at. Yes, you are right. We saw hospitalizations tick up between yesterday, today. Still, you know, I will say with hospitalizations, because we do have a lot of hospital capacity, you know, we're trying to look at that in the context of is our health system able to handle the number of, of cases? and. The answer is overwhelmingly yes. So in addition to hospitalizations, we do give a sense of, well, how many other empty beds are there? And we know we have capacity in our hospitals. So yes, we are watching that very closely. I wanna see what tomorrow, the rest of the week uh, brings us uh, in terms of that number. When I, but when I look overall, we've largely been stable. We've been in the 500s generally um, with that number. We do have a, a slight dip over the weekend. We think that's more a reporting issue um, than, than anything else. But so we've largely been in the 500. So yet we might be at the higher end of the 500s uh, today. Not sure what tomorrow will bring. But I think the overall message is stability there and our system able to have the capacity to handle additional infections should they come our way. And again, hospitalization is one of four trends we look at. No one of these uh, uh, trends alone can really give us a, a, a picture. I'd also say that hospitalizations tends to be a lagging indicator. So it very much to me says, is this telling me something about something that happened last week that we need to be aware of? So again, each of the indicators has its own limitations, has its own way of, of having the data come to us, which isn't always perfect. So that's why we need to look at the full picture, but we are very much watching that, that uh, slight uptick uh, in, in hospitalizations. But I would characterize that still overall stable given the high amount of capacity that we do have in our hospital systems at this point. Thank you. Next question is from Gary Robertson with the Associated Press. Hi, it's Gary Robertson with AP. Dr. Cohen, I, we, we had talked a little bit about, about contract tracing and last week I guess there was some uh, question about South Carolina and them uh, announcing that they were going to have well over a thousand contract tracing um, workers, and I know that uh, in recent weeks we said that we had hoped to double the number in our state, uh, but that seems to be smaller compared to what South Carolina is doing. It, it, or, uh, am I missing something on the numbers, or is it the quality of contract tracing that uh, leads you to believe that you're still very confident in 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 our numbers or in our um, in the work that's being done in that area? Gary, thanks for the question. As you know, we think that contact tracing 
in coordination with the increased testing is one of our foundational ways in which we are going to be able to keep viral spread low. And the reason for that is when someone tests positive, we want a contact tracer to reach out to them, find out who their contacts were, make sure those contacts who got exposed do get testing, and then you go from there. Maybe their contacts got got exposed if there was a positive test and go from there. And it allows you to more quickly isolate people who might have COVID-19, tell them to stay home um, until they are, are recovered. Um, and so that's why this is so important. Now, we are lucky in North Carolina. We've had have um, our local health departments have been doing contact tracing since the beginning of, of this uh, uh, pandemic. And frankly, for, me, for decades, this, this is what they do. Now, the scale at which they need to do their job is, is quite different um, as we think about going forward and needing to keep the virus level low. Um, so we already had about 250 people already deployed, and we are able to, um, what, what we have done is also ask our local health department, are there other employees that you already have that could also get retrained and get redeployed should we need it? So in addition to the 250, we're working right now to even bring up more of them. So we don't have to hire more new. This is just redeploying currently um, fo current folks at the local health departments. I don't have a number yet on how many we are, are planning to train, but I know it's a sizable number. And then we want to also go and hire the additional uh, contact tracing folks to be able to deploy. The important part for us about contact tracing is, is also having folks from the communities and also who speak the language that folks are going to need to do. So we've definitely put an emphasis on our new hires um, to make sure we have both English and Spanish um, so that we can be doing appropriate contact tracings in, in all of the communities here um, in North Carolina. So that we do want to be focused on, on that and our hiring has been um, specifically focused on making sure we're having folks come from the communities in which they're going to be calling, right? Because there is a trust issue here and we want folks to know these are trusted uh, public health officials that will be calling and asking folks questions. So um, we're really working um, hard to make sure that we are implementing a system that, that folks can comply with. Because what we're seeing from other states is they've hired a number of contact tracers, but what happens is folks don't, they, and they do it by phone, and we see that folks don't answer the phone. Massachusetts was one of the states that was first sort of first out of the gate and doing a lot of contact tracing. And we are actually trying to learn lessons from that, um, which they have been very kind to share. Um, things around the fact that, that if you just do phone, uh, it is often you will miss someone on the phone or they just don't pick up the phone. So we already are troubleshooting strategies um, to make sure that we can make the contact with folks on the first try, um, as opposed to having to call back again and again and again. That reduces your workload um, uh, as well. So we are trying to understand how many contact tracers do we think we're going to need in order to really be able to respond um, to, to the work here. So I, I would say this is a work in progress. I don't have all the answers yet. We're trying to learn from other states, learn from our own internal resources, redeploy what we can because we know we have to make all of our resources go further um, and then hire more as we go. So I don't have a new uh, number to share. I do feel like we're making good progress. I do appreciate all the work the local health departments have done um, around contact tracing, and I'm appreciative of our new partners really focusing on hiring folks who come from communities um, in that, that they're going to serve, as well as, you know, from a cultural perspective, but also a language perspective as well. Thanks for that question, Gary. Our next question is from Vanessa Ruff with WCNC-TV, Charlotte. Hi there, this is Vanessa Rufus with WCNC Charlotte. Thank you for taking my question, Dr. Cohen. I wanted to ask you about some developments out of Lincoln County yesterday. We had learned that a restaurant knowingly violating the governor's orders decided to open its doors for dine-in service. And uh, we were there last night as diners came in, sat down and had their meals. Do you have a response to this development? Vanessa, thanks for the question. As you know, as we thought about easing restrictions here, we were trying to be really data-driven in our decisions. First, we looked at our trends and said, you know, we were stable, we could go forward. And when we thought about some of those first activities that we could do, we knew that the virus gets transmitted more when people are indoors and they're sitting down for longer periods of time in close proximity. 
So some of the higher risk activities are anything that you could imagine that is indoors and sitting and potentially close, close by to one another. Restaurants, salons, as we talked about earlier, those are kinds of activities that are higher risk of transmitting the virus. As you think about other kinds of activities that we allowed in phase one, there are really two kinds. One was either be outside, right? Being outside allows you to social distance more. There's better air circulation. You're, you, um, you can be, be apart. When you're indoors, we wanted to allow indoor activities that allowed you to walk around. So if you were in a retail setting, you were at a clothes store, a, a florist, a jeweler, you can continue to walk around. You're not in any one spot for more than a few minutes as you look for an item. So we tried to focus on those kinds of lower risk kinds of scenarios first. So restaurant, as you can see, what is a high risk scenario. Plus we know when you are eating, it's really hard to eat with the face covering on, so we know folks are taking off their face coverings to eat and drink, understandably. So again, higher risk um, uh, situation that, again, we wanted to make sure we had a little bit longer period of time to see stability in our, in our numbers um, and that we have, are contemplating moving forward with opening restaurants just at the end of this week. So we'd ask folks to hang in there with us uh, as we look at our numbers, make sure we're stable. Um, we're not going to be perfect, right? We're trying to have this, this balance here of recognizing stability does not mean perfection, but we're stable enough to move on to phase two. So the folks in Lincoln, you know, I, I, I appreciate that, that the local community um, and, and folks there, you know, have, have called out, you know, that, that really isn't in line with the governor's request from the executive order. That is not currently at this moment the best interest of public health. Um, you know, we want folks to be making good decisions to protect not just themselves, but their community, right? Because the heart, I know this is so hard to understand because this is even new for the scientists um, um, and the public health experts. The fact that you could transmit this virus and not even know about it is, is a really hard and challenging part of COVID-19. And that's what we're trying to make sure that we are, are doing. Once folks get sick, I think many have gotten the message. They know if you are sick, stay home, stay isolated. Um, it's that period when you don't either know you're going to get sick yet, or maybe you aren't going to get sick at all, because some people don't get sick at all from COVID-19. It's a, it's a crazy part about this virus where some can get so severely ill, they're on a ventilator, and it could succumb to the illness, and others don't have any symptoms. That's why we're asking everyone to do their part. And this is what's really hard um, about this is because everyone has to do it together. But that's okay. I know that North Carolina, we can do this. It is hard. It will be a new way of move, moving through the world. Um, it won't be as comfortable to be six feet apart from our friends and our loved ones or to wear these face coverings. But we can go back to things like restaurants and salons when we do that kind of work to, to support each other. Um, and that's what we're asking folks to do. Please abide by the governor's uh, ruling. And when you are around people, do your, do your three W's. We can get through this together. So please, please hang in there with us. Our final question will be from Rebecca Martinez with WUNC Radio. 47. Um, and that's what we're asking. Hello, it's Rebecca Martinez from WUNC. I saw that the North Carolina Council of Churches has sent a letter to a congressional delegation from North Carolina asking for um, intercession on behalf of the North Carolina residents in ICE detention. I'm just wondering if there's any guidance being given to um, uh, state prisons or even enforcement regarding um, uh, immigration folks who uh, have varying immigration statuses to try to prevent their vulnerability to COVID-19? Rebecca, you were a little bit in and out there, but w what I would say about COVID-19 and how we're thinking about it, it goes back to how I was talking about the last question. We are in this together as a community. Those of us who are here in North Carolina, we need to be protecting e each other. Um, and this virus, does like it doesn't respect county borders or even state borders, or party lines, nothing, right? Um, they, this, this virus can attack us all. 
Um, and that's why we need to be in this together, right, to protect us all. And that means getting access to care for all, getting testing available for all, um, and to do it in a way that protects our, our entire state. So there's a lot of collective action that we need to do here uh, in order to fight the virus. And I'd say that's across the board where we're thinking about correctional facilities um, and what do we need to do to both protect um, those who are incarcerated as well as the staff. We are doing those things. How do we think about our skilled nursing facility? How do we think about our migrant farm uh, workers as well? Um, so who live in congregate settings, which we know are higher risk. I think whether we're looking at any of those populations or anywhere in North Carolina, I think the, the sentiment is the same about having um, us do these collective actions to protect each other. And then when we do that and we can get folks testing and we do these collective actions, like that protects us all. Every community is protected when all of us can get access to testing, get access to care, can get, um, can do the three W's, can do all of these things collectively. Um, and I know that that is, that is the path that will allow us to get back to those things that we love um, and allow us to keep moving forward in the phases of, of that, that are coming forward here. So, um, Rebecca, thanks for that, that question, and I, sorry I, I missed a piece of it, so we're happy to follow up um, after if there was another nuance there that I missed. And with that, okay, I think you've heard from, from both uh, Director Spraber and I a lot about the three W's. Um, we'll be back uh, later this week with more on our trends and uh, progress uh, towards phase two. All right, thanks so much.